Welcome. My name is Jeff Moore. I'm an Institute Engineer at Southwest Research Institute, and I'm presenting our paper titled Development and Testing of a 10 Megawatt Supercritical CO2 Turbine in 1 Megawatt Flow Loop. This is a work of uh, totaling about five years of effort, uh, and would like to point out and highlight some of our sponsors for this work. First of all, uh, U.S. Department of Energy under the Sunshot Program provided the lion's share of the funding. My company, Southwest Research, General Electric Global Research Center, Electric Power Research Institute, Ramco Services, Star Energy, and Knowles Atomic Power Lab all contributed both uh, funding and uh, technical input into this program, and we are indebted to them. This is a shot of our team members and co-authors, and this was a shot we took uh, celebrating the successful conclusion of this test program. The goal of this program was to develop a novel, highly efficient, supercritical CO2 hot gas turbo expander, which was optimized for the highly transient solar power plant duty profile. As many of you know, solar power plants can operate uh, under widely transient conditions uh, during uh, cloud cover events, uh, especially if there's no energy storage. This turbo expander increased, uh, and this program increased the TRL or technology readiness level from around three, which was kilowatt scale turbines in um, a couple of different test loops built in the US, uh, increase up to a working pilot plant, which is a TRL six. The goal also was to optimize and develop a recuperator technology that mates well for this application. So the recuperator is a critical part of achieving high cycle efficiency. The turbo expander and heat exchanger were, were tested in a one megawatt electric sized flow loop that was developed at uh, Southwest Research Institute. And both uh, units were tested. This was, uh, should point out, not meant to be a cycle demonstrator but rather a test rig to simulate realistic operating conditions for each, each piece of equipment. And there's some, some uh, important reasons uh, why we did that in terms of how we laid the plant out, uh, the test loop out, and utilizing of existing hardware. The goal of this uh, SunShot program was to achieve six cents a kilowatt hour. That's now been reduced even lower. And to, in order to do that, achieve a 50% energy conversion efficiency, essentially from heat input to electric, electricity out. And also reduce cost down to a uh, below $1,200 per kilowatt install cost. So fairly aggressive targets. The team, as I mentioned, uh, consisted, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, of these parties. Uh, it was a five-year effort, over $10 million spent. And uh, the Goal was to uh, try to achieve a 50% thermal efficiency in the cycle, not necessarily demonstrated, but in the cycle at a full scale 10 megawatt electric size. Obviously the cost to do a full 10 megawatt electric was at the cost prohibitive at this time. That is being pursued now under the uh, STEP program, Supercritical Transformation Electric Power Program that's also funded by the Department of Energy is being built at the Southwest Research Campus. So this was a very important first step to validate some of these key pieces of technology. The targets of this full scale at the time were around 14 megawatts. That's now grown to 16 as we account for more losses in the plant to achieve a true 10 megawatt electric output. Uh, greater than 700 C inlet temperature and an 85 percent Think of an isentropic efficiency of the aerial stages of the turbine. The simple recuperated cycle is what was implemented into the plant, and that consists of a dense phase pump driven by an electric motor that boosts the pressure of the CO2 up to around 250 bar. That then goes through a recuperator, which transfers about 75% of the heat input and that's taken off the turbine exhaust. So we're up to around 550C, and then that then goes into the primary heater, which was developed specifically for this project. Out of the heater is 715C into the expander. Uh, it expands down to, uh, if it's at the 10 megawatts size, back to around 565C or so, 
Um, we had a little higher exit temperatures because of the lower efficiency of the turbine for the reasons I'll state in a minute. And then that exhaust temperature comes back through the recuperator. It goes into a precooler, which uh, drops the temperature, uh, essentially knocks out most of the temperature. This is a evaporative heat exchanger fed uh, shell and tube heat exchanger. And then we had an additional chiller not shown in this diagram for the dense phase pump, which required the flow to be below 20 C. And that was using a commercial sized uh, refrigeration cooler. Okay. I think I skipped ahead a little bit. Okay, uh, this is the layout of the rotor and shows the uh, the layout of the stages. It's a four stage axial flow turbine. The thrust balance is managed by a balanced piston, which is also dropping the pressure from high pressure to, to the exhaust pressure and then ex recycled, recirculated external to the machine. And so the inlet conditions, again, were about 250 bar, 715C, expanding down to around 84 bar. Because of the uh, high temperature, we have to have a thermal management region to reduce the temperatures down below what our bearings and seals can tolerate. And that's what we call the thermal management region. And I'll show uh, more details on that. Because of the high exhaust pressure of 84 bar, we have to use... Uh, better mechanical uh, seals than just elaborate seals like a steam turbine. So we're using uh, mechanical dry gas seals, uh, very common in the oil and gas industry. These are face seals operating on a, uh, a very thin fluid film of the, of the gas itself. Uh, there's a buffering gas that's injected to make sure the gas is clean and, and the proper temperature. And therefore a temperature gradient exists in this thermal management region. The bearings are we want a turbine large enough to be able to accommodate traditional fluid film bearings that's commonly used in the power generation and oil and gas industry. So these are tilting pad type oil bearings as well as a tilting pad type thrust bearing. It was designed to be a double end drive with a compressor slash pump drive on one end and a generator on the other. Uh, the one megawatt demonstrator uh, did not uh, require this, uh, but rather we uh, attached a high-speed dynamometer to one end, to, since we're only generating one megawatt instead of 10. Here's the thermal management region that I mentioned, and so this is the hot section of the turbine, and this is the dry gas seal, and so we develop a nice axial temperature gradient throughout this region, min trying to minimize uh, thermal stresses in the rotor, and we achieve that by what we call a thermal seal and I'll show a little more detail on that in a minute. Rotor dynamics of any high pressure turbo machines is, is important. This sunshot rotor was especially challenging, one because of the relatively long flexible nature of the rotor, resulted in a critical speed ratio of about 2.4. In other words, uh, it operates 2.4 times the first critical speed. And the gas density, even though it's hot, it's still fairly high and it's over 100 kg per meter cube. So this is an experience chart um, plotted against centrifugal compressors uh, with these same parameters. So if we did this on a steam turbine chart, it would be very much an outlier. But even against centrifugal compressors, it's still very much uh, a challenge right near the experience limit of uh, this is a, uh, from a paper uh, that I co-authored with GE. The critical speeds, of course, is important. And we place the, uh, the critical speeds away from the operating range. And it actually runs between the third and the fourth critical speed. So here's one, two, three critical speeds. And then this is the operating speed. This is a critical speed map of critical speed versus bearing stiffness. And this is approximately where our bearing stiffness curve is. So you can see we have good separation margins from the third and the fourth critical speed. To make this design possible, we utilized, utilized a whole pattern damper seal at the balance piston. And this seal is very, very effective in providing positive damping. And uh, we can see here a log degrement plot versus the taper, seal clearance taper of that seal. And so this is the normal design operating range. And we're getting log decks, uh, logarithmic decrements or log deck for short of around, uh, around 0.8 to 1 in this operating range. And that's very, very stable. 
we're also uh, mindful of if, if the seal goes divergent, then it's some, some modes can be driven unstable. So we're very careful in the management of that clearance profile. Make sure it doesn't change under operating conditions. These were the operating conditions uh, in the uh, test loop. Uh, coming out of the pump is about 255 bar, 252 into the recuperator, 251 into the primary heater, and then uh, uh, are coming out of the primary heater. So that's going into the turbine, and then out of the turbine is about 86 bar, and then back to the recuperator. And you can see our temperatures, uh, it's fairly high coming out of the recuperator, and it's because we took a 10 megawatt flow path and reduced it down to a one megawatt of flow. So the blades basically went from around uh, an inch or 25 millimeters tall down to one tenth of that, one tenth of an inch or two and a half millimeters. So, and we did that to preserve the, the correct pressure distribution and velocities uh, throughout the turbine uh, while being able to accommodate a one megawatt test loop. Why didn't we just design a one megawatt turbine, you might ask? Well, we wanted a frame size of the turbine to be large enough to be relevant uh, for larger scale applications. So essentially it's a 10 megawatt frame size turbine tested in a one megawatt test loop. We also had to develop, we thought we could commercially source the primary heater and it turned out it just wasn't commercially viable to do so, not without significant cost. So the project team decided to uh, develop the heat exchanger ourselves. This is the end result. It's a staggered tube type, um, Fairly simple uh, multi-row heat exchanger. I think there's around seven rows of tubes. And we use a very high approach temperature with the hot gas. This is basically uh, coming off of a natural gas furnace at uh, atmospheric pressure. And uh, with a high approach temperature, we could keep the heat exchanger size down. And this was all constructed with Inconel 740. And as far as we know, it represents the first heat exchanger out of this advanced uh, nickel alloy for pipes. Uh, so we're pretty proud of that. It worked quite well. On the recuperator side, we had some challenges with the original um, microtube heat exchanger uh, developed by THAR in the final stages of manufacturing. They got very, very close, but had some, some bonding issues between the tubes and tube sheets, so these uh, one millimeter microtubes. And uh, we end up having to source a uh, different heat exchanger uh, from vacuum process engineering. And this is a, a more conventional uh, printed circuit, multi-plate diffusion bonded type of uh, heat exchanger, as you can see uh, in the diagram here. So we had to make uh, appropriate piping changes to accommodate that. And that was done, uh, uh, that was done uh, and, and implemented into the test loop. This is a picture of the VPE recuperator and it essentially looks like a box, but there's a lot going on inside of this box and with all the little bitty passages and there's five and a half megawatts of heat transfer into this 18 inch by 18 inch by 24 inch box. So, and then you can see it after it's been insulated. And it's located very closely to the, uh, to the turbine to minimize piping thermal growth issues. This is a picture of the uh, GE uh, Baker Hughes now uh, dense phase pump that was uh, procured. This is a commercially available pump and we didn't want to have to develop the compressors for this test loop at this time. So we procured a dense phase pump commercially. And this is the upstream filter. Uh, there's a strainer and also a chiller heat exchanger. And you can see the chiller, uh, rental chiller we, we use to run about 30, about uh, three to six degree chilled water into this uh, heat exchanger to get the uh, essentially a dense phase down below 20 degrees C, well below the critical temperature. The assembly of the turbine went very well. Uh, a few fit up issues initially, but we resolved those and the rotor run out we were very mindful of to try to keep it to very low values. And we also built the uh, turbine with uh, a low speed balance of the rotor and uh, be, being a, a single piece rotor, which I probably didn't mention before, but the rotor is manufactured as a single piece with the disc, or you could think of it as bliss integral to the shaft. And that's to accommodate later the very high blade loading that you have with a 10 megawatt turbine. We wanted to demonstrate that we could do that. Uh, this shows the turbine assembled, moving over to the test stand. 
there we connected all the large piping, small piping, lube oil, supply and drain, gas seal supply, and vents, and instrumentation. This shows some of the major, major pieces, and this actually shows the first uh, inlet plenum that we, we attempted to cast out of Haynes 282, but ran into some difficulties with that and quality of the casting. So we actually scrapped this one that you see here and fabricated one using uh, Inconel 625 and a multi-piece fabricated approach. And that worked quite well for us. This picture, you can actually see that the inlet does look a little bit differently. It's a fabricated inlet. Uh, and that, that approach uh, worked quite nicely. The casing is stacked up uh, in the multiple pieces. So you have the inlet, you have the center spacer, you have the exit collector. And then on uh, this end, you have the uh, dry gas seal, bearing housings. And on this end, you have a radio bearing housing, a thrust bearing housing. You can also see how closely the recuperator is mated and we have a dual exhaust coming out of the turbine going into a dual inlet into the recuperator. And in the background, you can see our heater. It's also located very closely. And this is an Inconel 740 inlet pipe coming from the heater odor. And it's been post-wheel heat treated, which is why it's a darker color. This is the final uh, installation of the turbine before it was insulated. And you can see all the uh, uh, associated lines. This is the alluvial supply. At these speeds, the lube oil requires quite a bit of flow uh, around on this one end, around 32 gallons a minute. And so a fairly large drain to be able to accommodate that. And the rest of these lines are dry gas seal supply, uh, dry gas seal vents, buffer seal supply, and then there's a buffer seal on the end as well. And on the end is where the, uh, the air dynamometer would go. And this shows the, uh, the rig all completely assembled. These are the two main test objectives. Uh, the first was a more moderate speed of 21,000 RPM, 550C, 200 bars. That sort of represented a more, I, I wouldn't call state of the art, but more conservative operating condition. And then the final design point was 27,000 RPM, our full inlet temperature and essentially full inlet pressure. And this, this graph shows uh, the cumulative starts and hours. Uh, we achieved a close to about 40 operating hours um, at elevated temperatures. And the number of starts uh, were somewhere around 12 to 14. And the design targets, uh, design temperature, for example, here was uh, eventually achieved in our seventh test. And the maximum pressure was achieved uh, during our last test. And then the maximum speed was achieved uh, early on in the test program also uh, actually closer to the last test. Uh, we, we achieved high speed at lower pressures and temperatures during mechanical testing, but as far as the high speed with, with uh, high temperature and pressure, it was achieved one of our last targets. This is the uh, cross section of the machine uh, during test and actually overlaid with a lot of instrumentation uh, data points. But this is a test where uh, we were at 27,000 RPM and uh, close to around uh, 3,400 PSI inlet pressure, which is uh, very close to uh, our target pressure at this point in time. And then the inlet temperature at this point was around um, 1,100 degrees inlet temperature. The vibration spectrum was very clean, uh, very low synchronous vibration, very essentially no subsynchronous vibration. And that was true of uh, the entire test operation. We had a one trip that I showed here due to a problem we had with the uh, natural gas fired heater and uh, essentially very clean behavior on the way down. This was an interesting plot. This was not an infrared camera. This was with a visible spectrum with the lights shut off and you can just see the, the high temperature around this heater. So the gas temperature of this heater is around uh, uh, it's around 1400F, which I believe is uh, around 850, 875C. So it just gives you an idea of the uh, tense heat that this heat exchanger and the turbine were operating in. This was our, our endurance test. Uh, we did a six hour endurance test at maximum temperature of 715C and held it for uh, about six or seven hours. And uh, the turbine and the rest of the loop went very well. We ended up tripping on a low natural gas um, uh, a supply issue to the uh, to the heater, but uh, definitely 
tested our uh, ability for the turbine to respond to an ESD. The, uh, this shows the um, thermal seal that was used in that we end up testing two different thermal seal designs. So again, this is the hot side. This is the balanced piston. And over here is the dry gas seal. So the dry gas seals can only tolerate up to about 150 C. And we have 700 C gas shooting out of this balanced piston here, which is diverted out, out of the casing here. So this region here is very critical. And we, we came up with an initial design and then later under a separate DOE funded program called the FOCUS program, uh, GE developed another thermal seal design as shown here. And so we're going to compare these at these identical operating conditions uh, between uh, the original SunShot test and then the FOCUS test. And these are the, the resulting temperature distribution. So this, this graph is aligned with this cross section. So the bearings are running around 200, maybe 100 and uh, 80 degrees uh, at the gas seal supplies. This is all in Fahrenheit. And then we have 715, uh, actually during this test, we were around 1100 um, Fahrenheit going into the turbine. And then this is the thermal management region that we were talking about. So this is uh, the sharp temperature gradient on each end of the machine. So we had a lot of instrumentation on this hot side with inside the thermal seal, both axial and circumferential. And that this represents an average of those circumferential readings. And you can actually see the two thermal seals actually behave fairly similar uh, between them. the shape of the curve is a little bit different, but actually both gave very good behavior. We also had some turbine transient trips. I won't cover too much, but uh, this just demonstrated the ability of the turbine to be able to accommodate fairly, fairly rapid changes in, uh, in temperature. And it did quite well. Uh, our performance data is shown here. And because of the one megawatt scaling and uh, the fact that the blades were very small, our turbine efficiency we knew going in was not going to be very good. And uh, in fact, um, we didn't have a, a, a great understanding of what the losses would be inside of the uh, turbine, both from the CO2 windage as well as the bearing losses. We had a better understanding of the bearing losses. And so the, the measured performance based on enthalpy drop across the turbine is shown in this graph here versus speed. And we also overlaid our uh, predicted losses for the uh, journal bearings. And the difference is going to be windage inside of the machine because we had not yet installed our air dynamometer on the end of the shaft. So essentially, the turbine power is all going into losses inside the turbine both from the journal bearings as well as uh, windage. And you can see we uh, achieved up to about a 375 horsepower out of the turbine and uh, follows, of course, a, lean, uh, a quadratic type of curve with uh, speed. We also plotted that versus volume flow, and you can see a, a similar trend here, peaking at around 375 horsepower. So again, the goal was not to demonstrate the performance of the turbine that's fairly well established for axial bladed designs but rather to uh, essentially verify the mechanical thermal rotor dynamic pressure containment all the other aspects of the turbine design we also plotted the uh, balanced piston leakage compared to prediction and we actually uh, was less than prediction but showed a very similar trend and uh, that was that was encouraging likely due to some uh, changes in uh, radial growth of the and reduce, reduction of the clearance during operation that we probably didn't fully account for in the predictions. So overall summary, the, the turbine performed and met all of the uh, key objectives of 715C inlet temperature, 27,000 RPM, and 250 bar. And at the time was the highest uh, SCO2 turbine in the world that's at least that's been published. Um, I don't want to take anything away from other researchers out there, but at least what was in the literature. Uh, thermal seal uh, maintained acceptable behavior uh, with the dry gas seals. Uh, we did have one dry gas seal failure throughout the test program that was not attributed to excessive heat, but rather the heat that it did see, uh, it, it actually started generating its own heat due to an internal labyrinth seal rub. So that was corrected. The second test went much better. and We were able to complete the program.
All the vibration was less than half a mil or about 12 microns, so no signs of instability. So we're very happy about that. Low critical speed response. We had good bearing damping and good balance of the rotor. Good thrust balance, as indicated by uh, low thrust bearing temperatures and fairly even thrust bearing temperatures from one side to the other. Radial bearing temperatures were low. Uh, we did have some high temperature originally just due to the radial bearing clearances being a little too tight. Those were modified and that was corrected. And many, uh, many shutdown transients were tolerated. Uh, the the drag S seal panel was modified to ensure that we always maintain high, or I should say warm seal gas to the gas seals. And during filling, uh, you go through uh, a period where you're near near the operation near the dome and, it, and essentially uh, the gas coming to this gas seal panel is a liquid. And so the, the gas seal panel has to uh, accommodate that and uh, it was able to uh, heat up the gas uh, sufficiently throughout that period. We had one time where it, it tripped and we ended up uh, damaging a gas seal, not catastrophically, but damaging it during non-rotation. Uh, because of dry ice formation. So that was uh, definitely a, a concern and, and something going forward that we're always very careful to make sure we always deliver warm, dry, and clean seal gas. So those are all the, uh, that's all the material I have, and I really appreciate your attention.